Do you, do you guys pay for the heat and electricity or is that part of the rent here? We pay... Yes, that's a good question. So we pay... I will interview you. Hey, that's fine. Hey, and, and the, the cool thing about the podcast is we're already going. Oh, perfect. <laughs> this is a podcast. So yeah, so the question was, do we pay for heat and electricity? Yes. So we're... Our lease agreement, which you can negotiate anything in right. a lease, yeah. you know, but our lease agreement was that we are going to be responsible for all utilities. Okay. And then... I believe I'd have to look at our lease, but I believe we're responsible for like maintenance of the HVAC, like so like the heaters oh. ah, and okay, stuff. Okay. Um, but if they fully break, then they, they pay over. for that. Okay. Like these pipes up here, you can see uh, those leaked. So those had to be oh, replaced and okay. we didn't have to pay for that. So any, um, Ty said it the other day, what was the word? Infrastructure. Yeah. Any infrastructure stuff, toilets, stuff like that. Okay. We don't have to pay they for take that. Care of it. Okay. Um, so, but like we got to pay for like snow removal. Um, just for in front of your doors. Yeah. yeah, just in front of our doors. But we like people with the building, we just pool money together okay. and, and pay. So it doesn't end up being that much. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll buy you guys. It would be a lot we, of money. Uh, you'll be surprised. We, so we were in Ohio for what, seven years since 2000, 2015 to 21, yeah. six, six and a half years. We got way more snow in Ohio, in Ohio than we do now in Not the mountains more inch wise just it melted way it in the mountains it'll snow and then melt right away because we right. have so much snow or sun in Colorado right and in Ohio there was never sun well and then were you guys in a part of Ohio that you would get lake the effect snow belt. Yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we purposely yeah. picked oh, in yeah. the snow belt yeah oh my yeah. gosh yeah that was fun <laughs> it's it's crazy I remember I went to a meet uh, Dennis Mitchell used to have oh, like yeah. the Akron, Akron yeah. thing out there I, I drove out there one time and I jumped really well I qualified for USA's which for me was a really big thing um and i remember driving home getting caught in a snowstorm yeah. like in that snow belt area and i was on the side of the road for 14 hours <gasps> with a broken down car <laughs> and oh, just like yeah. i had my hunting bibs on like you know like my big you know snowsuit basically and i it was a bad situation a, ca a cop car pulled over <laughs> and was like are you all right and i was like well i'm stranded on the side of the road in a really bad <laughs> snowstorm and he's like okay See you later. <laughs> and then he just <laughs> left. And I was just there. It was really sketchy. It was really sketchy. But yeah, And I feel like they go with less snow down there at Akron. Yeah, but to come back here, he probably went back up yeah, to Cleveland, Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. No, he... Cleveland, Toledo. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, Toledo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was... It was supposed to be like a seven or eight hour drive. It ended okay. up being like a 17 or 18 hour yeah. drive. It was yeah, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> crazy crazy ride but anyway thank you guys so much for coming yeah. really appreciate it all the way from colorado and uh we're here at the essex i think they're calling it the dealer conference um so if people at home hear noise in the background that's what it is <laughs> i think it's rens bloom talking about uh how they're trying to sell poles in uh, europe <laughs> so anyway um thank you guys so much for coming and I guess we could just kind of get started with, like, we know a lot about, like, Katerina and all her success, like, after college and winning an Olympic gold medal and all those things. But I personally don't know much about how you started. And I think it might be interesting to hear that coming yeah. from an international perspective. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, I was born in Greece. I grew up in Greece um, in 2000, right after the Sydney Olympics first Olympics where women's pole vault competed. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad said, oh, you know, I think you'll be good at this event. Uh, so we went to the Olympic Stadium in Greece and we tried, my, both my parents did track and field, so they both had a lot of connections with coaches in the federation. Uh, so we, instead of going to a club, which is what most people would do in Europe, we went straight to like the federation coach. Uh, everybody in that group was you know, 23, 24 years old or older. And then there was me. And the coach, the very first day I tried out, said, oh, I think you could be good at this. 
Uh, so he brought in a couple of other girls. Then one girl left. Then boy came. He always tried to have some other like kid around me just for me to have like friends of my age. Yeah. Um. So that was about ten, ten and a half years old. I was in two thousand. Uh, in two thousand one. So at eleven, I actually broke the world age group record for 11 years old but it didn't count oh, because no. in Greece there was no competitions for 11 year old girls for pole vault so I had to compete in like a guys masters competition I jumped 230 <laughs> so I actually don't know what the 11 year old record is now but if you had counted it might have still been it <laughs> and then 12 what, what was it do you remember two, two, two meters 30 two meters 30 wow so that's that, crazy yeah, yeah. um then I broke the 12-year-old, which did count, 13, 14, and at 15, I broke the 16 and the 17-year-old age world record. Whoa. Yeah, so at 15, which will be a freshman in high school here, yep. I, I jumped 437, 14, 4. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's so crazy. Yeah, but, but listen to this. Uh, didn't PR again until my junior year of college. So six years. Holy cow. That's yeah. actually a really, really good thing to talk about because we deal with athletes all the time that are frustrated that they haven't PR'd yeah. like in the last month. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah, saying? Like, mm. So like talk about like what that <clears throat> was like, like mentally and just everything going through having not PR'd in that amount of time. Yeah. So I'm going to put some, some like bits and pieces in there from my story also, because I think it's important. So, Absolutely. so at 15, I jumped 437 that summer. I win the, um, um, we were calling it Youth World Championships. I think now they call it the Under 18. Well, I actually think they stopped it now. U20. No. Is that what it is? No, it was U18. Uh, they stopped it a few years ago, actually. It was too expensive for World Athletics, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. But I was two years younger than everyone when I won it. Um, and the next year, I started having... I mean, I gained a little weight, but not looking back at pictures and videos... Not enough for like the freak out that went on at the time. Uh, we went to different dietitians, uh, diets that even right now that you know my livelihood is pole vault, I don't think I could follow. Uh, wow. And ended up kind of in you know the the edge of bulimia, I would say, maybe a little past it. I don't know. Um, so I quit at 16 years old. I quit pole vault. Uh, would go out and like jog and I had around my 17th birthday I said you know what I like pole vault as an activity I don't need to be an Olympic champion I just like pole vault so I went back into pole vault significantly overweight I would say at that point and uh, with a different coach coach. so instead of going back to the federation coach I actually started being coached by an old teammate who had just retired and was now uh you know, starting to coach. And that summer, uh, so two summers basically after, you know, my my good year of like the under 18 were I heard, uh, I went to World Youth Championships, so under 18 championships again. And I was second. I jumped 425. I took attempts at equaling my outdoor PR. Um, so it did feel like... You know, I had just only practiced for six months and go to take attempts at tying my PR. I was second in the world again. So, okay, that wasn't such a terrible year. Um, The next year I had a little bit of a mental block, qualified. At the time, uh, there was like an A and a B standard for under 20s. So I qualified with a B standard, like the worst standard. Right, right, yeah. Uh, and they kind of took me because I was who I was and I had already gotten a couple medals and I qualified for the final for under 20s, I think I was like 11th, like at the very edge. Mm-hmm. And then in the final, I had like a 15 centimeter season best, again for 25 actually. Oh, wow. Uh, ended up third. Uh, so I ended up getting a medal in the under 20s too in a year that I did not expect it. And then that fall... I came to the U.S. Uh, to start college at Stanford. Um, my freshman year was a disaster. Just weight, very, very different training than I was used to. Um, Who were you training with? 
there? So my freshman coach was Coach Mac, okay. uh, who is actually coaching a lot of uh, multis at Chula Vista now. Yep. Um, I think he's a very, very good coach. I just think I'm a very different athlete. Mm. Um, we kind of say like more like a Porsche than like a, you know, a truck <laughs> <laughs> and, and kind of need to train that way. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there were, there were some issues in my first, um, but I think freshman year is hard for almost everybody. Uh, I always tell kids expect to not do great your first year in college. And that year, actually, I started looking at different types of scholarships to quit pole vault again, but I wanted to stay at Stanford. Mm. And that summer, Coach Mack left and Toby Stevenson came in as a coach. And Toby was one of my favorite pole vaulters growing up because I grew up in this like very like Russian military type of like, this is the only way to be successful. And Toby was like so far away from that. And I was like, well, look, he's successful. Like you can do it a different way. Yeah. So it was kind of motivating for him to like become a coach. He had just retired. And that brought a little bit, you know, motivation back to me. I jumped, I think, I don't know, 14, one, my sophomore year with Toby. Oh, I can't remember, actually. It's a lot, long time ago now. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's been a minute. Yeah. And then I think my junior year, I finally PR'd, jumped over 440. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And so what was that feeling like? Where was it? How did it oh, happen? Gosh. Do you remember? I don't remember. You can't no, remember? No. Oh <laughs> I can't remember. Oh, man. Yeah, I cannot. I think there was just so many times between those, you know, in those six years that I did attempt a PR. Yeah. That I don't quite remember where I finally got it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's very, very interesting. And that's a really good point that you bring up about your freshman year of college yes. like i i blew up my freshman year of college like it was you know blew up my weight blew up my everything blew up my freshman year of college and it's uh, i think it's important for kids to understand yeah. you know it's a big change yeah. you don't realize it's happening and then all of a sudden it's like you're on your own yep it's a new training regimen and and yeah, it's it's very interesting. And you're making that decision based around talking to somebody for a few phone calls. Like Oh, I had never been to the US until I moved into the dorm at Stanford. Isn't that, yeah. isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. It's just like yeah. I mean, you have a couple conversations with somebody and then you're like, Yeah, I'm gonna spend the next four years yeah. you know, training <laughs> yeah, with you. For sure. And I think we're a great fit. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it's like that that you know, even with you and Toby, I'm sure that it probably took a year or two and then it started to really start to click. Or... You know, I will say that with Toby, it was easy or easier anyways, because I, I think his type of training and what he did was much more similar to what I was used to. So I was and what used is to, that? What is that? I was used to doing sprints and my sprints were maximum up to 60 meters. After that, it was not a sprint. It was a stride. Yeah. We would do it just for rhythm. Uh, and that's kind of what we did. In fact, with Toby, we did a lot of 30 meters. Um, just like some flying stuff, more plyos. Um, <clears throat> with Coach Mac, we did a lot more long distances that I had never in my life done. Long like, distances had been like 200, 300, 400. Yeah. 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 Okay. I just didn't have the base for it. And of course, this is what you go to college. You try to become better. But for me, I, I think I was getting like a little injured from that. I yeah. bulk up pretty easy. So I think part of the weight I gained my freshman year was a lot of muscle. Mm. Um, we did do a lot more like volume in lifting. I think there there's, there's times to do everything maybe, but I think with Toby, we found like a slightly better balance. Yeah. Uh, and I just think, you know, for somebody like me that I started at 10 years old and moved to <coughs> the US at 18, I've trained eight years in a very specific way. Mm -hmm. I think it's really hard to go a completely different way. I think, yeah. I think a certain, that certain type of training with like more volume could be very beneficial for somebody who grew up that way and had that base but I couldn't sustain it. Think about this for a second. This is something that I've been kicking around for like the last few years is because you oftentimes see 
that there's like this kind of stigma with like, oh, whenever you go to college, like you're not ready for the college training. Like you're not ready for it. Like it's, we're going to kill you. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, it's just like, okay. You know? And then what happens is, is you end up seeing a lot of people come back and having gained significant amount of weight. And some of that, in my opinion, could be muscle. You know, if they're training really hard, they could be gaining muscle. But also there's also the idea that your body is constantly stressed. And if your body yeah. is constantly stressed, it feels like it's dying. And what is it? It's not going to release anything. It's going to hold on tight to every single yeah. little thing that it can because it feels like it's dying. You're killing it. <laughs> and then once you, st- the, fun- the ironic thing is, is once you stop doing all that cra- crazy training and just modest, like high intensity, low volume training, you're all of a sudden your weight just kind of yeah. regulates again back to its natural state, not this state of just constant stress. And so that's what I like this fall, like college fall training. I always gained so much weight during college fall training. And I think it was because my body was just getting beat the crap out of it. You know, yeah. I don't yeah. know. What do you think about that? Mitch, step up. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Talk. <laughs> uh, I don't have anything insightful here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you. I think that can be, but I also think that it's possibly at that point in the season, it's good to train heavy. Yeah. Like, I think it's not such a bad thing to train a little heavier and then you come into peaking in season and you're a little lighter and everything's just a little easier without doing that makes anything. Sense. Yeah. So I don't think that necessarily always it's a bad thing, but I, I agree. It's probably just survival mode of the body and survival mode. Yeah. That's what I, 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 and you know, I don't, I haven't done enough research to have any science to back that up. It's just like a thought experiment that I've been going through in my head to like, think about like, why would it be that, that we see kids come back from college on college breaks and they've kind of ballooned up a little bit. And, and it's like, Hey coach, how you doing? Like, you know, I'm like, how, how's college, you know, how's college? And like, I got shin splints and, <laughs> and, and I've gained 15 pounds. And I haven't been drinking at all. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's right. none of exactly. That. Exactly. So, and I'm But not... it's a hard age too, especially for girls, I think, like hormonal changes. Right. Like, I feel like I didn't eat that bad at one, one point in college and I was way heavier. So I think it, it is right. also like you know, this hormonal regulation that for some people happens in a year and for some people it happens in five years mm. and then you can like be normal again. But you've had like change of diet too. And when we go okay, to Greece, course. it's technically good food, Mediterranean diet. Right. I gain weight every year. Because really? Because it's food that I'm not used to processing. Mm. More olive oil than you will ever eat in your entire <laughs> life. Her mom it's uses true. at least like this bottle of olive oil it's every true. day. Yeah. It's crazy. They have a but pump on the olive oil thing in their house. <laughs> There's two two daughters, a husband and a wife, and they have an olive oil container with a pump. Literally. That but, is but, so funny. but I lose weight yeah, every time we go does. back. So my body knows how to process that food. And he Maybe you're doesn't. just better at burning like Cheese. fat. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you're just but your body's more adapted yeah. to burning fat. And our American bodies are adapted to burning carbs. <laughs> and process. And process yeah. processed processed carbs. Anything, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, you I just this is actually a good experiment that, you know, I you you could just you could try. It wouldn't really impact you that much. But this is how I got on that thought pattern was that I started to see a high correlation between when I first start my, like when I would first start my squat program at the beginning of the year, that's when you're re- you get really sore and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sore. And I would start that squat program and I would instantly gain five pounds. Yeah, me too. And, me too. and I would be like, what the heck? I'm yeah. eating the exact same that yeah. I was prior to this. And then two weeks later, almost on the dot, once that soreness was gone, I was five pounds down. And yeah. I would be like, okay, it seems like my body is holding on to stuff to repair itself yeah. and then releasing it once it's done. For sure. No, and to, and to your point, I think I do, I do the exact same thing. I cycle through our training cycles the same way. And I also cycle throughout the season where I'm always a little heavier indoors and I'm, I always lose weight outdoor. 
and I'm not trying to lose any more weight outdoor. So it's almost like what you're saying, there's this stress in the body from, you know, winter training or preseason or whatever you want to call it, that slowly kind of goes away as you're peaking and like the weight also goes away. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing to think about. But uh, anyway, so now whenever you were at stanford what i'm just curious what what did you study like uh i studied human biology uh it was a very multidisciplinary field so people went you know to like uh healthcare and just i i did neuropsychology was like my main uh, focus mm. and then after i graduated i moved to arizona I was in a PhD program and trained with them at Nick Heisong's place. Mm. Uh, and that's how I met Mitch, actually. And I studied cognitive psychology there. So that was the PhD program I was in. I finished my master's in 2015. And I said, no, maybe it's a good year to take a year off of school. And But she never. really didn't. She wanted a PhD because she wanted to be a professor. Yeah, I want to and teach. And she yeah. realized the bureaucracy in yeah. universities that it's more just about money, not really yeah. teaching the kids it's about getting research grants and right. research grants require you to do what you don't like to do and it's not about teaching it's about the bringing research. in money yeah right so she was deterred by that and that's when she said i don't want the phd anymore i think i have yeah. the master's I, why would i do this i don't want to use it now right so. that's interesting yeah so is there so you originally wanted to be a professor yeah at a university yeah in psychology yeah, I I, th I feel like giving a lecture is very much like performing in sport. Like you have to spend the time to be prepared for it. I think there is a little bit of natural talent involved in like lecturing, but you also have to do the work. And then you're like on stage and you have to perform now. So it feels very similar right. to me, like sport. Uh, I think I, I would be very good at it, but there was this... Like during my my master's slash PhD time, we accepted all these like research studies that brought a lot of money to the university that had nothing to do with what we were studying. First, I don't <laughs> think we had good enough experience to study what we were being given to study. Right. And second, we had most I had no interest in studying what we were being asked to study. But there was a lot of money from like the military, so we were like, oh yeah, we'll do that. So and it was very driven by like whatever we tell you whatever whoever's given us the money that's what we study i, I mean at the time I, I was with a younger professor so he would like apply for a ton of grants and we did a lot of functional mris so i think that was like mostly what they were going after with picking our lab mm. uh but just the topics were not so related. So then you're doing your own research for what you want to have your master thesis or PhD thesis on and something super random. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I hear a lot about all that goes on inside of the universities and yeah. it's just too much for my head to handle. <laughs> um, what was your... So you went through college and then what... Like after that junior year, so you have your personal best your junior year, and then tell us about like kind of ending college and then pushing into like that post collegiate career. Yeah, so my senior year was 2011, 2012. Um, I also went through a little mental block in the outdoor season. What's a mental block? Because you said that a couple mm -hmm. times. What different? Dif I guess I would define it differently at different ages because I've gone through different ones. But I would say it's like a run-through issue, but I feel like to a different level every time. Mm. Like sometimes it will be up to a certain pole, other times it will be all poles, other times it will be a certain run. Uh, so that I feel like that summer I would like not take off on anything, like that spring. And then we went to Pac-12, so that was the first year Pac-12 actually. Uh, I think it was in Eugene, and I kind of came out of nowhere. Not out of, I mean, I was, I was one of the favorites based on my PR, but I hadn't been jumping grade, mm -hmm. and it kind of came out of nowhere and PR'd. I jumped 448, which is actually, I think, now the Stanford school record, uh, two centimeters under the Olympic standard. Ooh. It was 450. Yeah. Uh, so we, Toby kind of found some small competitions here and there and we chased that Olympic standard and we got it. I done 451. So I competed in the London Olympics. Mm -hmm. uh, and from there, 
I mean, I was going to Arizona, like there was like a very clear path of this is exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to study and I'm going to keep pole vaulting on the side. You looked at Chicago too, though. She... I did. Yeah. I came and interviewed here, actually. Yeah. At, at what? At University of Chicago. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good psychology program. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good school. Yeah. 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 A little tough side of town, but it's... Yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't... I have no idea where I would train. This was the harder part. And oh, in, yeah. in Phoenix, there was this, like, really cool group. At that time in Illinois, like, if this would have been here, like, yeah. at that time, it would have been, yeah. been okay. But at that time, there was just nothing... Yes. Like, sustained... Like, that was... You could count on every week to, For sure. Like, and the train. indoor. Nothing indoor. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I jumped at University of Chicago, uh, their indoor facility one yeah. time. They got like a little raised runway and my buddy like landed in the box and snapped his leg in half <laughs> in, yeah. that, in that box. Yeah. So every time anybody says University of Chicago, yeah. I just think about that. It's a bad, bad situation. Were you there <laughs> for that one? I was. It actually, uh, it was the reason why I didn't want to go to North Central. <laughs> yeah. oh man yeah that's sketchy so anyway so really quick just a little segue i tell our guys all the time like i wish i could talk to somebody who's a run-through guru mm. do you guys have any suggestions for helping people that have significant run-through issues Tough, tough I mean, <laughs> to me, most of the time it's coming from a functional problem, not a mental problem. Right. So I think, depending on the degree, I would always just move back and start back. and Move back. Move forward. Right, right. <clears throat> and start over. And start from Even ground one. in 2022. Yeah, we, had, we had many years that were just that. Right before Eugene. Like a month before Eugene, she decided she, she would not plant a ball. Mm. She would not plant two steps. Mm. Like could not plant it. Not 22. It, Eugene. But anyway, I feel like there's several years where in one practice, I would start, you know, my little drills. I will go to like a four left, take some nice jumps. I will go to a six or a seven or an eight. And then I would suddenly on not change anything. I would suddenly stop taking off. Mm. Um and many times we'll have to come back to the beginning and start the practice from the beginning. Many times we'll have to work through it. And But I feel like those practices are the ones that make you better. Like, it's yeah. easy when it's easy to just come take some jumps. Yeah. Like, how do you get over that? I think this is what you're training, really. Right. And I do think it's different for everyone. I think it's different every year. I've used different yeah. techniques, you know, mental right. cues every year. But for sure, I do think that at least for me, I, I don't feel like I'm scared of a pole or pole vaulting. I think whenever I do run through, it, it's a <clears throat> a posture change in the run, whether it is because I took a new pole or... The, but like so most of the time, I, I didn't change anything when I started to run through. So I just would start running different and then run through and then you run through a couple of times in a row and then you're like, oh no, I'm running through now. Well, even you if it's, to start running. Yeah. yeah <laughs> even if it's like a, like you're going up a pole and, and the weight is just For sure. slightly yes. heavier, yeah. you know, and then that slight, and then you start to drop that pole and it feels yes. like it's dropping and it's too heavy. It, I mean, it's this much heavier and you know yeah. that, but while you're doing that at that high of a level, it can become very overwhelming and then you get to this crux of the run where it's just yeah. like okay what way am i going am i going this way or am i going that way yeah. and, and the problem is, is a, like a lot of the kids we work with they just keep choosing that run through direction and and it's it's a very i think it's a uh some sort of functional thing too like i think i think with the kids we work with, probably not you. I'm not trying to like coach you or anything. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I'm saying is, is the kids that we work with, sometimes their pull tips are so high, so late in the run yes. that visually and like their depth perception is like, like their brain's like, no, 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 red, red, yeah. red, stop, stop, stop. Because their pull tip's so high and the box is so close and it's like, 
you know, throwing them the yeah, wrong yeah. signals, you yeah. know? And then the other thing too, is that posture. If they start falling forward, they start falling down and, and then it just, you know, throws up those red flags. But I think my, one of the most interesting podcasts I ever did was with Steve Hooker. And we talked about, I didn't know this, but he said he ran through for like three years straight. Yeah. We saw him at Chula, Chula Vista, Vista and he wouldn't yeah. take a jump on a 14 foot pole. Yeah. He ran through for three years. Yeah. yeah. I remember towards the yeah. end. Yeah. I was like, what? That yeah. is crazy. And For somebody too who like was injured when he won the Olympics and yeah. like came in at like five ninety or whatever it was, yeah. you know. But maybe that distraction also helped him. If yeah. he's already a mental person and injury is a good distraction. I think probably he is either way on or yeah. way yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you can do what he did in Berlin at those world championships. Yeah. He was on, yeah. and and when and when that a person like that is on, nobody can stop him. Yeah, you know. But then they kind of swing back this other way, and and he had a hard time. But he said the same exact thing. You just have to start over. Yeah, you have I to think start you over. You have to just go back, and especially with young kids, what's the hurry? Right. They yeah. they're not gonna do anything in college anyway. If you jump four sixty in college, congratulations. It doesn't matter. I'm not saying that to deter you. Right. I, right saying that as good or bad it's not going to make your future your mm -hmm. future is your future and we always say the people who make it professionally in pole vault are the ones who just stick with it yep and you mm -hmm. see it over and over and over this girl jumped really high her freshman year of college and then for five years struggled mm -hmm. and then just kept going and going and going and finally she'll just kind of climb in and yep. walk on and we've always seen that and people get in such a hurry you just if, if you out you can outlast people for sure yeah. <laughs> and i think yeah. if you just slow steady consistent jumping all the time always works yep i well, would rather you landing off the back of the pit jumping on way too small of a pole and jumping and getting a feel of a pole than running through absolutely yeah. i don't thank you care. for saying that yeah like to me especially in high school like if you jump 19 feet in high school as a boy <laughs> It is not going to make you a professional pole vaulter. Yeah. So there's no hurry. You have time. You have years. Yep. Consistent jumps, feel the jump, learn to feel the pole, learn to feel the rhythm of the whole event, and it that's, will come. And that's what Brad said about uh, Katie when we were on the podcast is he was just like, the reason that Katie was able to do pretty well these last few years is because she's been able to just be patient and string together multiple healthy seasons and that's yeah. the other thing too is if you're constantly just bashing big poles every single day your body is eventually going to wear out and especially as you get older too uh your body's going to wear out and and that's the key thing of what you said right there is just consistency and it's not just one month of taking good jumps or two months it's one year two yeah. years three years four years a decade and once you get to a decade of taking consistent jumps without any big interruptions if you're not professional then then you need to, <laughs> <laughs> you need to be done <laughs> but that that is uh the absolute truth so what is it like winning an Olympic gold medal? Uh, you know, people ask this all the time, but I don't think there is an answer. I don't know. I don't know if Katie has done one of these and answered it or not. <laughs> she has, yeah. uh, I just... For me, so I've now competed in three Olympics, but in Rio I had co also competed in London. And I feel like I can tell you, and I remember so much more from London, where I think I made one bar that I can tell you from Rio oh because there was like such high stress. You're coming in as, I feel like it was me and Sandy as the favorites at that point. Uh, I got sick, so I was on antibiotics uh, for two days before the final. Uh, I was like running back and forth to the bathroom. She injured her hip flexor at the last time in league. Like, yes. Three weeks. Three weeks before, before the Olympics, and Jeez. we went back to Ohio, and she couldn't jog for so two I weeks. So I didn't. Yes. So for we didn't sprint. We didn't jog. We didn't do anything. Anything for two weeks except rehab and just try to and, like, like lift and mental yeah. work. We yeah. just said, okay, you've done this so many times, especially this season. We're just going to practice it in the mind and try to get your body healthy, and we're going to go there. And hopefully you can last through the prelim and into the final. Yeah, so the, the month or the three and a half weeks before the Olympics, 
I ja- I took four jumps and all four of them were in Rio once we got to Rio. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. that's crazy. See, this is the part that this <laughs> podcast <Yeah. laughs> is good because nobody knew any of this. Yeah. They just thought that it was just... Oh, Katerina, she just waltzed her way in to yeah. the gold medal, <laughs> yeah. and it was a great celebration. Yeah. Yeah, that was a trip. Yeah, but Our see, bags I feel like... didn't make it for like oh, three yeah. days. The poles didn't make it. Yeah, we that was we the were most stressful on the part. tarmac in Chicago, maybe. No, we were in Atlanta, and I specifically remember, I feel like we landed in A, and we had to go to like Z, you know? <laughs> and we were running because the next flight was the next day, and it was full for real. So I was like, what are, what's going to happen? And they kept us on the tarp back for like an hour and a half in the plane. Yeah, so we, we landed, landed in Atlanta, and we just sat on the plane. <laughs> they didn't have a gate to get us out. And then we got out, and we like sprinted. And then we got there, and that next flight was also delayed, but the like they were not updating, you know, Google. And we I think we met up with like Sean Barber there, and I don't know, Jeff, I can't remember who was there. Uh, and I said, if our polls make it with us, I will win the Olympics. And our polls didn't make it. And I was like, well, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, you did, so hold on, you didn't, your polls didn't make it either? Uh, the, the polls made it, the polls and the backs came three days later, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Super fun. That is yeah. <laughs> so crazy. So what, like, where are your guys' heads at in the midst of all of that? Like, well, probably good distraction, like we talked about yeah, earlier. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. I think almost every championship, like a lot of the European championships, we've ended up the bus doesn't show up to the hotel. So we just take a taxi and then they park us like a mile away from where we can enter with the taxi. So we're this on the day of- This has happened several times, yeah, the, actually. Three or four times. So we've- they drive us to the stadium. We have to walk like a mile around the stadium on the day of a final. <laughs> and then she wins. But I always think these good distractions, wow. like it keeps you thinking about something else. And then you get in there and you're like, okay, now I'm here to pole vault. Well, this actually happened this year in Budapest. Yeah. Of course, I didn't compete. I got injured in the first jump, but the bus didn't show up. We ordered like a lift. Whatever, no, it was Bolt, whatever it was called in, in Budapest. Uh it couldn't go into like the the area like of the stadium, so it dropped us off in like a random gas station. We climbed over some rocks, past like some train racks, and like I mean, we we walked a mile probably to get into the warm up area. This has happened several times to us. Right. I consider it good luck at this point, except for this year, of course. But <laughs> yeah, that is really really crazy. Yeah, that that was something that with my career, like I I remember thinking to myself multiple times like i remember one time i had to walk like almost a half mile with my bag my pull bag yeah and i was like so defeated like i was like there's no way i'm competing well today there's absolutely no way i'm competing well and i didn't compete well i did terrible (laughs) and it was awful so like there's got to be something different that you guys but look do how you mentally. approached it. You said, there's no way I can compete well. Every time something like this happens, it's my job to say, okay, this is going to work out. It's going to be nice because we're, instead of being in a bus that's crowded and stopped, we're going to be in a nice taxi and try to like... So you're, you're a, the situation into your something job. We can okay. Use. Okay. Got you. Yeah. Yeah. So that was just me just by myself walking with my pool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't even want to go anymore. I'm going home. It was so hot. It was in St. Louis. I was like, this is the worst. Um, so that's an interesting thing. And that's a very special thing that you guys have is that you have him to be able to just be like, Hey, Cause like in your head, like, yeah. so, okay. So you, yeah. so we know what he's thinking now in a situation like that. So what are you thinking in a situation like that? Well, I, I mean, I will say this because I can remember the first time this happened and it was the prelim of the first European championship I won in 2016. And it was like six in the morning and there was a bus there, but there was no driver. And the driver that was there at breakfast was like, oh, I've worked so many hours. I'm not allowed to drive anymore. And we're like, well, they said there's a bus at 6.30 and like, there needs to be a bus. So you were freaking out a little too. And you had gone up to the restaurant trying to find somebody who could drive us. Yeah. And there were other athletes there. It wasn't just us. I think there was Zook for sure, I remember. I don't remember who else. Um, so I feel like Mitch is like kind of a, a problem solver at that point. And then I feel like once this happened, and it was a prelim, so it was a little like lower stress. I had to jump for 40 or 450. I don't remember. 
Uh, so it all kind of worked out. Then every time after that, that this happened, we were like, oh, you know, we kind of know what to do now. You just have to stay calm and right. find a taxi and you might be the bus. But yeah. it's like that in the whole sport almost. Like we used to say in 2015, 16, yeah. that who's ever prepared for everything to go wrong the most will mm. win. And yeah. that's how our sport is. Whatever we want to wish it was, it's not. There's going to be <laughs> terrible food. There's going to be terrible travel. You're going to show up after like a 12-hour flight and nobody's there to pick you up or doesn't realize you have poles with you to pick you up. Yep. And it's just fighting chaos all the time. Yep. And you just have to have it in your mind. This is not the NCAA. Nobody's <laughs> taking care of you. Nobody cares. Right. So right. figure it out, <laughs> yes. get there, get there ready to jump. No matter how bad your day was, they don't care. They expect you to jump. And I love that. And you have to get your mindset around that and work everything you do to work with that. So now we're starting to see the quiet guy no, actually yeah. <laughs> got a lot of good stuff going on, man. This is, yeah, I, we were just talking about it on our last, our last podcast. Um, you know, I've always kind of thought that a person's strength is in their lack of need like i i don't need things to be perfect to jump well and that makes me stronger like i don't need to have like if if my poles get lost i don't need i don't need my poles i could jump on somebody else's poles like those types of people who are just able to roll with the punches like that are just so strong and they're so hard to beat yeah. They're so hard to beat those people because you can't really do anything. Nothing can mess them up. <laughs> you it know? can come back at you, though. I feel like a lot of years, especially the Diamond League is not set up so that they care about the pole vault. They're not going to turn the pit, no matter who you are or what you are. The TV set up the day before. If the wind is bad, the wind is bad. Jump in it. Yeah. and That's sad. So for a few years, it was bad at almost every meet. Yeah. And Katarina does very well in bad conditions. She jumps the same. Mm. So we created this mantra in our heads like okay no matter how bad the condition you're going to go in there and you're going to jump the same so we want bad wind it's mm. good for us it's good and then That's in I'm like 2019 20 every competition we went to was like perfect straight tailwind we went to qatar for world champs and they had an air conditioner that blew a tailwind in an indoor <laughs> stadium so it was like the greatest what setup you, you could ever me? have yeah and it almost worked to our downfall because for so many years we said, we do better in bad. We don't want good conditions because yeah. everybody else does bad. So mm. then when we got good conditions, we were like, oh, sh crap. The girls are going to jump really well because they yeah. all do good with raised runways or tailwinds. Right. So yeah. then right. It, it kind of, you have to be careful about these ideas you set because they work both ways. Yeah. And when situations change. And it always just boils down to balance. You know, it's yeah. just we have to be balanced as athletes and balanced as coaches and just, you know, really try to emphasize that. So it is interesting. Something I was thinking about on the drive over here is. The concept that you hear sometimes of if you win an Olympic gold medal, you made it. The rest of your life, you made it. Like, that's <laughs> that's it. That's the end all be all. I feel like that's the way a lot of people think. Like, if you accomplish this one thing at, at your young age, you know, you've got a lot of life left to live, you know, that it just sets you up for the rest of your life. So tell us a little bit about, like, what happened after you won the gold medal and just like some of the good things and some of the tough things? Yeah, well, so I had like a four year, so 16, 17, 18, 19, I won the Diamond League. Uh, I think 17, I went undefeated. I won world championships. I was started in the world. I won two times the European championships. Uh so it wasn't I won the Olympics and then things came to me. It's like for four years in a row, I won a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, things came to me. Things came to us. Uh, I th you have to think, and I, I, this is one of the things I told Katie because we had a long conversation after she won in Tokyo. It's a very different market if you're American and if you're European, especially European from a small country. It's a very different market if you're a sprinter and you're pole vaulter also, right? So we're talking about pole vault now. Um, 
When I won in Rio, Greece had five medals in those Olympics, not in track and field, in the whole Olympics. So wow. it was one of five medals. Right. Um, you know, when Katie won, she was one of, I don't know, 30 American in track and field. So it's it's a very different market. So we had a lot of sponsors, you know, big sponsors, Olympic sponsors like Toyota, like Visa, uh, smaller companies and it almost becomes a little tough because of these big companies that have big budgets come to you and you start to set your price here and then there's like really cool smaller companies come to you but they can only afford this much and you are like well this is not fair f- for them that are paying me this much for the exact same thing right. but I want to collaborate with you for this and this and this reason but we had a few years that we definitely did very good but I just cannot be- I had six, seven spo- big sponsors, especially at some point, I don't think it's the same for Americans. I think Americans get paid more by um, apparel brands than Europeans do, mm. but they're missing out on all the other sponsors because, you know, Toyota USA is only going to sponsor three people from track and field. There's such a big pool. Right. Visa is only going to sponsor five people from track and field. It's a, it, so I think they they kind of miss out on that. We do we make some money, you know. It's, it was very interesting throughout my career. I at the beginning of my career, the bigger percentage of our income was from competitions. You competed good, you made money. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I started to become more successful, that went down. Even though I kept doing good in these competitions, percentage wise, that was a small percentage of our income compared to sponsorships. Right. Now I will say towards like the last few years, it has gone back to you know you need to compete good. Right. I mean we we still have some big sponsors. But it it kind of goes up and down how like that income works throughout right. your career. Um, I think it very much matters where you're from. I think I'm lucky to be from a small country with less Olympic medals every right. Olympics. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So was that like? Did you ever feel like some, when some of these big companies came in and were like, "Hey, we want to, you know, sponsor you and collaborate with you or whatever"? Did you ever feel like pressure, uh, mm. like? to com- pressure to perform or pressure just like no you know areas. i i feel like with all those companies i actually have well, except for one i have one that i have this like bad feeling about well, we're, we're not together anymore yeah but all the other companies most of which i'm still with actually uh i know the people mm. i know that they chose to sponsor me and not somebody else with an olympic medal from greece because of me not because i won an olympic medal but they wanted Katerina, they wanted Katerina that has a master's degree that studied at Stanford. I think it was like the whole package instead of an Olympic medal, which, like I said, we had five more. Right. And in Tokyo, we, we had different people medal. So I, I do believe that in a small country like this, people get to know you more and companies are choosing to sponsor you you not the athlete but the person right right so is there a certain level of celebrity that you like gain in greece whenever you yeah win the gold medal oh yeah it's it, every time after a championship is pretty crazy like this year was by far the worst though and she didn't win any yeah it was like <laughs> you, when you reach 10 years then everybody has to yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. You, you've done this a long time now you're yeah. always on tv you didn't win anything but everywhere we went this year it was just yeah, non-stop was like you, is that right all the yeah. time we eat if this you go summer. to the mall if you go anywhere like people will stop you take pictures they know her like oh my it's gosh. a different world she's like a football or basketball player would be in the u.s like but there is like there was over the years there was that. definitely like after a championship it was crazy like I remember after the Olympics we pulled over I don't know if you've ever been to Greece we have this like tiny little market like it's literally like a box that like sells gum and cigarettes because everybody smokes yeah and we literally pulled to the side of the road and Mitch, Mitch ran out to buy like a pack of gum. And people came out of that little like mini market thing to take pictures with me in the car. Like I don't know if they oh recognize gosh. him or me from the. It was like insane. That's wild. Yeah, and it has happened after every championship, and then suddenly this summer, like I don't know what happened. I was like, 
everywhere we go and you know greece has like really bad parking issues so you have to like know how to parallel park mm. and i'm very self-conscious about it and i feel like when i'm trying to parallel park people are like watching me and they're like oh look at her kind of very nice she can park <laughs> <laughs> she can pull about 16 yeah. feet but she can't parallel park <laughs> the funny thing is she's a very good parker i don't know why, yeah. what like, the insecurity is stress out about it <laughs> i mean the anxiety when that you get whenever i have to pull or parallel park <laughs> pretty bad especially if somebody's like behind you yeah oh my yeah gosh, so bad um so we don't want to keep you too long since um you're gonna do a little workout after the like yeah. later on in the day and yeah. we want some time you know before that um but where are you at now like just kind of where where are we at you know both of you guys i would be interested to hear both perspectives well me decided to retire <laughs> really <laughs> the, the sport is very long it's very stressful it's very frustrating in the beginning i feel like as you're growing in it you learn a little bit more and you're very excited and you think oh if we did this or if we did that as far as like structure of the whole event not pole vaulting i think pole vaulting yeah. is pole vaulting it's relatively easy compared to like helping the sport become a sport. Right. So as she got bigger and she joined like World Athletics as a athlete representative and all of this and you find out more and you think things are going well and then you realize how the chaos inside the whole system is and Ugh. it's a long way from changing and a lot of things have to change before small good changes could happen. You get a little bit frustrated what are some things that you would want changed i'm just curious like i mean for like for instance street meets and diamond leagues like they're putting street meets out more with professionals because the olympic committee wants them to because they would like to see events outside of the stadium in the olympics so how would you like to qualify for the olympics and go jump in a street meet in tokyo <laughs> yes are you serious yeah That's so like, this is like yeah. one of the big pushes because they think that we have to continue to change everything to stay tuned to the audience so then all of world athletics money terrible. comes yeah. <laughs> essentially from uh, ioc ioc so okay. ioc gives them money because they compete in the olympics they're the biggest sport you get x money per <laughs> whatever that and then world athletics gives us that money to federations to support the clubs right. But then IOC is the one essentially funding everything, even though they're doing, okay, they're setting up a pretty, pretty big meet, pretty, pretty good one. <laughs> right. But 100%. Yeah. That you're giving your people, you're doing this, all the athletes are competing, IOC gets the money, then they give it to IAAF, World Athletics, and then they decide the rules, but IOC is really deciding the rules mm. based on what they want, which nobody knows anything about track and field in there. They're just doing what they think is going to be popular now right. based on a whim. Right. And you you suggest basic things like, have you ever done a survey at a street meet to see, is this getting people to come into the stadium? Simple as that. Right. Like, hand out a survey there. Are you more likely, after watching this, to pay for a track and field in the stadium, or are you going to watch it on TV? Because in the street right. meet, they've proved that they're crazy expensive. Yeah. And they bring no revenue. We were talking but about we're pushing that yesterday. The sport that way. We like, were talking about it yesterday about how it was just like the first question somebody brought up that they ran a street meet in the states, and uh, they were like, first question, was it profitable? And he was like, ah, no, no, <laughs> not you know. And that's what's so hard. And we've talked about it too. Like, do we put on an event? Like, do we put on an event here, like rent stands, like big stands, and and have like an elite event here? Yeah. And we were like, okay, it'll probably cost around, what do we say? 30? <laughs> I think, like, to do it the way we would want to yeah. do it, you do it nice. You have the grand, like, the grandstands, and you, you do, you have the TV, the real thing. And I was like, yeah, we were like, we put it, because we would pay all the athletes, pay them parents, yeah. all, all of that stuff. And we were like, 30 grand. And then, we're, and then we were like, okay, and how much, how much revenue are we going to get yeah. on that 30 grand? And we were like, five yeah. <laughs> five grand yeah and it's so difficult man so yeah these street meets that's very interesting i it is interesting because i was i've 
over the last three years, it's like, why are, there are a lot of like Diamond League street meets. And, and like, it's frustrating too because even the CEO of World Athletics now, he used to run a street meet in the UK and he said, I do not like street meets. They're they un- lose money. They lose money. <laughs> yeah. They cost a lot of money. They take right. a lot of time. They don't do anything. I don't like street meets. Yeah. And then, Flip-flopped. so we were excited. And then yeah. a year later, he's flip flopped all the sudden. Yeah. And then, okay, we got to have these street meets for this. Well, at least do a survey. Is it doing what you believe yeah. it's doing? We'll write the survey for you. You right. just need to hand it out at all these meets you're doing. Yeah. Nah, I don't know. Like, seriously, this is how we're running a multi million dollar corporation is now. Nah, I don't know. Yeah, I can't take right. this free survey and hand it out and do it. Like, right. Could you imagine that scenario that you're talking about? Oh, we, that you I think, for the I think we came close for Paris. Yeah. Yes. So Paris I don't Paris. think it will happen. I, but I think we came close. So I don't know what will happen in LA. Wow. Yes. So uh, I, I don't think I'll compete in LA. So I don't know my problem anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I will feel terrible for like all these people that are training for these years to go jump, you know, in front of the Eiffel Tower that you probably there's already street me doing that you know right yeah yeah and it's, it's just not the same feel no like when like my brother qualified for the world championships in 22 and i was coaching him there and i was just looking around at, and the stadium was packed and i was just like this is a very special thing like special moment in my life and special moment in his life yeah. and, and then seeing mondo break the world record you know and the whole meet shut down and yeah. clap for him. Like it was so cool. And you just, there's absolutely no way you will be able to recreate that feeling on the street. No, no. And it wouldn't Plus, be more profitable. Is it profitable. Yeah. Like, <laughs> let's run a business, please. Like seriously. at the end of the day, yes. is it profitable? Yeah. Stop but, asking everybody but to volunteer say... their time for everything. It's crazy. Like, right. We heard a story. I think it was Earl Bell. Somebody walked in his house and Jeff. saw the a medal on the wall and said, oh, that's so cool. Can I touch it? And he said, the exact reason you're so excited about seeing that medal is exactly why the Olympics is the biggest scam in the world. <laughs> like, really? you, you use these athletes. You don't allow them to use their own sponsors, sponsors during this time. Right. And then you make a ton of money. And then you send the athletes away that weren't allowed to make money, even for what they do. And then they made you a lot of money. Like, Whoa. it's to me, this is the NCAA thing where they allowed people to, at least they were getting uh, scholarships. They were getting $40,000, yeah. $50,000 in scholarships. Okay, they're kind of, maybe they're losing out a little, but they're nowhere near to what the Olympics is doing. Wow. I never and thought about that. And if you think that. about it that way, like, it, but it's crazy to to bring it back because this whole conversation started with what would we change about the sport or what is the problem with the sport i would tell you basic things like you arrive at a meet and they come to pick you up with a car that doesn't have racks and mm. okay i can tie the poles on the side but it's not legal in europe you know um i've had that happen where i arrive at a meet and i'm supposed to go to a train so somebody's supposed to meet me take my poles and send me off to the train and I arrive and they say what is this pointing at the poles <laughs> right. uh, you know you arrive at a meet they come and they pick you up and they say oh we just have to go pick up one more person but the one more person has an hour and a half delay so you're now after you've traveled 10 hours you're waiting at the airport for two more hours for the other person so that they drive you together so they're not going back right. and forth and usually the drives are two two and a half hours yeah. the logistics so. yeah yes, the logistics, the logistics. Yes. like it, it's tiring you, yeah Travel, travel, travel. You eat terrible hotel food. Usually the hotel rooms are not great. And you just travel in. You do this for three days, travel out, and do it again next week. And yeah. this is I, the life. I and think, it's, it's tough. I think that at this point in our career, if I can go back and say, pay me less money, but I want you to take care of me. Ooh. Like, I want you to bring a car that will take me straight to my hotel. Pay me less money. I don't care. But for the rest of my career, you know. Right. take care of me i think i would do it but i don't think we're ever given the option to do that. pay me less money and take that money and make sure your systems work yeah like whatever systems you're using to manage the meat like make sure they're working yeah like, and i mean it would help my performance too right yeah. if yeah. i right. am less tired yeah, exactly it that's will help great, your meat that's yeah. a great great comment or yeah. even change the whole setup like right right now it's set up where the diamond league takes care of everything they organize the hotel and then they do the catering and they do the transport set it up like tennis you guys get there 
figure it out. Prize money is now three times higher because we're not paying for all of this stuff. That's, That's not good, good anyway. Yeah. It's going to make it more entertaining to watch on TV if somebody's jumping for $100,000 instead of $10,000. Oh, yeah. You know, like I think simple things like that change the marketing. They Athletes can, oh, I have a friend in England. I'll just stay with them. Then I'm staying with friends. Wow, that's a great You know, point. like we save so much money. We save so much time. And we can put it back in the sport that helps market the sport. Not here's these athletes staying at the Motel 8 and all Okay, travel. no uh, Motel okay, 8. they're but... not really <laughs> <laughs> Like, I don't know. It's... Can we get you on the uh, USATF uh, <laughs> <laughs> committee no, or something? <laughs> we need him as uh, the, the head of that thing, man. This is, that's crazy. That's, uh, those are all really great points that I'm sure not a lot of people think about. People yeah. think about when they see you and part of this is social media. Part of this is just media in general is they see the, the gold medal and the picture with the gold medal and, and everything. And it's so cool. And I'm so thankful that you guys took the time to come in here and just give us some background on what it happens behind the scenes. I don't want to sound too depressing because <laughs> I remember when I was jumping real. and Toby Stevenson had posted a video, something like this after he retired and said like, for this all of you that want to make it, this is a hard sport <laughs> and it's not worth like yeah. the most deterring thing I ever heard. I like wanted to cry afterwards and I was like, <laughs> why did you say that? What is going on? Like, <laughs> no. And I understand, but I don't want to come across that way because it's cool. You, you see the world. Yeah. You see a lot of cool things. You learn a lot of cool people. You. It's just many years, you know, yeah. and you are starting to be like, well, you know, we so in the Diamond League, at the end of the meet, they give us a form to kind of give them feedback about different things, how was transfer, how was food. So, you know, for years now, we've given feedback on certain things that have not changed year after year yeah. to the point where you're like, well, I don't want to give feedback no more because I'm just wasting my What's time. Doing? Yeah. I yeah. say, oh, you know, it's serious. We're going to make controls of this. Feed. Like, you don't change anything. Right. Right. But again, let's try to turn this back to a positive well, note it's, about No, yeah, I mean, I mean, everybody. I, so this will, this will spin it to positive. <laughs> everybody would just completely trade everything to be able to have an Olympic gold medal. Like that is a yeah. cool, cool thing that to have. And what well, to be given one? To, to be because, given one because but, to earn one is actually very to, hard. Right. 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 <laughs> But but that's the positive about it. The yeah. positive is that you ju you accomplished one of the hardest things there is to accomplish on planet Earth, which is so cool. Yeah. Like that is a very cool thing. But we can't the way that we stop the progress because my I've at Rise like our our situation here and all the things that we're doing. We're really trying to make an impact on on a lot of areas, but the business side of, of pole vaulting and pushing and making smart moves like other sports do. So you can't just keep sweeping this stuff under the rug. You can't, you can't mm -hmm. just take all those things that you just laid out and you can't just be like, Oh man, all these things suck. Uh, just sweep it under the rug yeah. and move you know, to the mountains and yeah. go biking <laughs> yeah. every day right, and right. <laughs> enjoy your life. So, so that's, and, and that, so I think it is important to bring it up. I, I know it might seem like, oh, it's this is depressing or this is going to deter people. It's not going to deter people. No, it's going to get people fired up. Yeah. It's getting me fired up. Yeah. Like I, I feel like, you know what? Let's start to just go after some of these things, you know? Actually, the international stuff and the world athletics, I'm gonna, I hope somebody else picks that up because <laughs> I, I, I have my ideas about what I think can help, you know, grow our, our sport but you know what, Ty and I were talking about this world. one day. The problem is the sport has just enough money that you're like, oh, I want to win the demo league. You know, I want to like give it all to win the demo league, to win the world championships. I think if it would almost be better if the sport started losing more and more money for a big restructure to happen. Mm. Versus right now, there's just that like balance that it keeps it floating, just not the right way, maybe. An athlete's but I would say to you know the positive note again i think that this is the cool part about the sport because i don't believe anybody's doing this for money i think they're doing it for this higher goal mm -hmm. regardless of money i would have still done the exact same thing even if i didn't make the money i did 
because of the goal of wanting to, you know, win the Olympics or go to the Olympics, really, because that was really my goal. But you um, shouldn't have to choose that. You right. shouldn't have to choose, right. like, hey, I'm one of the greatest athletes in the world and I'm going to choose, you know, like, I should be I should be compensated for that, you know, yeah. and, and you should be compensated for that if you're helping prepare her for that. And that's just how business works, because athletics at the end of the day is just another business. It's yeah. just another business, especially at the level that you're at, you know, and and it just there's a lot of things that are messed up. But I think you made a point earlier that you said something that's somewhat controversial, which is, you know, people need to stop thinking that they have to give everything away for free and they have to stop just like being we have to we have to charge money for stuff sometimes yeah. and we and and that was was really hard um psychologically for me when i opened this place was mm. i i I knew what I wanted to do for the community. Like I knew I wanted to have a place that kids could come and do this. I wanted it to be high quality. I wanted to have good people incorporated with it. But I knew in order to have those things, I had to have money and I had to charge people, you know, for stuff. And I hate charging people money for stuff. But we will never, we will never grow if we don't, do that because it's just a basic human thing you know you have something of value that i want which is pole vaulting education or whatever i'm willing to give you some of my money so that you can share with me some of that valuable thing yeah and it's just a basic human exchange and i'm not we're not looking for an unfair exchange just a fair exchange. You're exchanging your information and your resources for my money. Well, and it also, you know, in either example, makes you or you more motivated to spend more time, to, to study more, to want to learn more, to teach better. So I think it makes the person who is receiving the money more motivated to do a better job now since they're receiving the money. Exactly. Because when I go home and, and I tell my wife, like, hey, I was gone you know, all day yesterday, <laughs> all day today. And my kids, I got two little girls. When I tell them, hey, we're, you know, I was gone yesterday and I'm going to be gone today, you know, tonight probably too with the camp. Um, but tomorrow we're going to go to a movie because I have mo enough money to take you to a movie and go do that. So then my family sees like, oh, this is an exchange. Like yeah. we're going to have my dad gone for a little bit. But then we get to go and do cool things, you know, with him afterwards. You shouldn't have to sacrifice your whole life to be able to like try to run something like this or, or things like that. You know, it's just a fair exchange at the end of the day. So I could go for like hours talking about <laughs> this. So what are we doing today really quick uh, after this? What's the workout looking like? Um, so I am at the three left <laughs> right now in the season. <laughs> and she's not allowed to go back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She will very much want to with <laughs> new stimuli. She she will go back to a full run and jump on big poles today. <laughs> right. Um, I specifically didn't bring spikes for this reason. Oh. Okay. Uh, so yeah, where where I three left, we I mean I had the injury in Budapest, so we're just starting to kind of run. We've trained a lot. Really what was in the that injury, month. really quick? Ah, uh, so. In my very first, you know, like one thing that I've done since I was 11, in my very first drill, I felt like I bent the pole a lot and he was going to shoot me out of the pit. Me says I was nowhere close, but I just had this like feeling it, of like... It was a 12 foot pole, 360, okay. and she was going to jump out of the back of a pit. And the funniest <laughs> part is in that moment in the air, I thought, oh, if you fall off the back of the pit, there was like a bunch of camera stuff. And I was like, you're going to sprain your ankle. So I decided I was going to put my heel down on the pit to try to kind of like slow myself down to not go off the back. Uh -huh. And as I put my heel down, my spike go caught on the pit. Now, this is World Championship, so it's a brand new pit. So it's pretty stiff as well. And it kind of pulled me this way. I don't know how to explain this in words. Um, so it turned out to be, I think, like a high ankle sprain, which does take longer to, to recover from. Mm -hmm. It's been now almost two months. We've trained for one month. We've done a ton of core. I actually feel the strongest I've ever felt starting training. Oh, good. Yeah. So I think there was positives in all of that. Um, I think really, at, without the injury, I, we wouldn't be jumping right now. 
we you know you we would have taken one was Eugene at the demoing final mid September yeah. so we would have been you know just, just starting. starting maybe not jumping just starting to train mm -hmm. so I feel like I'm a month ahead because of the injury now yeah, with yeah. everything uh, but the other day we did do like a crazy hill workout so I am a little dead my cast are a little sore so I've said I'm gonna start I'm gonna do a warm-up and you know I can take 10 jumps or I can take 50 so yeah, yeah yeah just see where it goes yeah, yeah. well we're all looking forward yeah. to it she wants to play on the little balls is the truth hey that's <laughs> fine we got a bunch of them over there so <laughs> well thank you guys so much again yeah. really appreciate it and this is the one more jump podcast see you guys